What we're saying as the um, power, what Westminster's saying as the power responsible for security and law and order, is that while these two kinds of politics are legitimate, illegitimate politics cannot be tolerated. You can't do this kind of thing uh, in a civil society, in a democracy, uh, through the gun. They have been taught in their schools. Uh, to be anti-British and anti-Protestant. The reason why there's the trouble is here is because people, people here have got religion and politics mixed up. What stops Catholics and Protestants living together is the question. The existence of this state. Ten years of war, it has been ten years of peace. And it's 700 years of war, not 700 years of peace. The attitude of this organization is that if anyone can assassinate a known Republican or an active Republican, we would not disapprove of it because we find we are fighting for survival. with the failure of their discredited cause. The men of violence have chosen in recent months to play what may well be their last card. But if these men, who were mature, sensible, honorable men, decide that they must go on hunger strike, I would consider that the reason for that must be so terrible that it's the reasons we should be looking at rather than the men. In the spring and summer of 1981, 15 young men, prisoners in Northern Ireland, decided as a final form of protest to begin a hunger strike. Over a four month period, 10 of these men were to starve to death. Michael James Devine was the last of the hunger strikers to die. To his community, he died a freedom fighter. To the British government, he died a common criminal. Within these two classifications, lies the germ of Michael's story. This is the conflict in Northern Ireland through his eyes. Michael James Devine was born a Catholic citizen in Northern Ireland, a state that had been created by Britain in 1921 at the demand of Northern Irish Protestants who refused to be part of the newly independent Irish nation to the south. Instead, they declared their loyalty to the Crown of England. The creation of Northern Ireland guaranteed these loyalists a new and hopefully permanent majority in population. But the new state inherited a Catholic minority of one third, who the loyalist government saw as a potentially disloyal population of Irish nationalists. The best way to prevent the overthrow of the government by a people with no stake in the country is to disenfranchise them. Former Attorney General of Northern Ireland, Major Curran. I recommend loyalists not to employ Roman Catholics, 99% of whom are disloyal. If you don't act now, 
before we know we shall find ourselves in the minority. Lord Baselbrook, later Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. In one of the state's first legal acts, the police, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, or RUC, almost exclusively Protestant, were given the power to search without warrants, imprison and interrogate without trial, and ban meetings and assemblies. The courts were empowered to deny the right to a lawyer and to conduct trials without a jury. It was the first Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, James Craig, who with Lord Carson had laid the groundwork for the new state and who declared, all I boast is that we have a Protestant Parliament and a Protestant state. 33 years after the establishment of the Northern State, Michael James Devine was born in May 1954 here in Springtown Camp, a former military base left behind by the Americans. Mick later described it as the slum to end all slums. In Springtown Camp, everyone was in the same boat. The conditions was really, there was no work. Most of the families, like Mickey's family, there was just Mickey and his, and his um, sister. But they loved with another family in the, in the hut in Springtown Camp. But most of the, like, the huts in Springtown, so they were known by huts, missile huts. Most of the huts, there was 14, 15 loving their hut, you know, you got 12, 13 kids and the mother and father, most some, you got the grandmother loving with them and then when one of them got married, they moved on. And it's not unusual for, for, the, for the man in the family, of any family in the town, to experience 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 and 30 years of unemployment. Some men haven't worked since the last war, which was the one time during some men's experience that they actually experienced total employment in the town, mainly because they were servicing the, the war industries during 1930-1945. Some men haven't worked since then and don't know what work means in terms of how it affects people today. Uh, when the civil rights movement emerged in 1967 as a tangible force, people really saw that as the, as the possibility of solving the problems. The, the demands for one man, one vote, for one person, one house, or one family, one house, was something relatively new, almost revolutionary, in terms of, of the politics of the, of the Derry people during this period. In 1967, inspired by the civil rights movement in the United States, a Catholic Civil Rights Association was formed. The civil rights marches were the first broad-based political expression of the nationalist community, which believed it might force peaceful change in Northern Ireland. And he says, look, I do 40 hours a week, and you make a great deal of profit out of my labor, and I'm entitled to a better wage. It's a very simple, very liberal demand. I am entitled to more money for the work I do. Yet that person, if he makes such a demand, can be fired immediately. Well, at that time, Mickey, like the rest of the boys, weren't, wasn't politically aware. It wasn't until the Civil Rights March on Derry in 68. He was only 14 years old at the time. And he was marching that day. He, in fact, made one of the placards to carry that day. And he witnessed the battening down of the RUC on uh, Duke Street that particular day. Well, that particular day in uh, October 4th, I think everybody in Derry marched. They all started off in good spirits. And I think it was the first time that the people of Derry was really united, that we were all out in the street marching for civil rights, for one man, one vote, for better, more jobs, better housing conditions. There was a whole balabahoo. They started battening and they, had the, they used the water cannons. There was a lot of people injured that day. And it wasn't until then that the Mickey and the like of them, like the rest of the boys that come, became politically aware. You know, Mickey didn't know what he was marching for that day. I remember the one particular song that we used to all sing was, We Shall Overcome. I would lay a pound to a penny that Ennis, like any other town, has its slum landlord. I would lay a pound to a penny that Ennis, like any other town, has got a great 
patch of land that is used solely for Yankees to play on. I would, I would lay a pound to a penny that there are quite a lot of families in Ennis paying rent they can't afford for property they shouldn't be asked to live in. That there are people in this town working for wages they can't keep their family on. For men who don't need half the money they're wringing out of the work of Irish people. The greatest help that you can give the people in the North is by showing the people in the North that they're not mad. They're not mad for believing. They're not mad for being idealists. So a reform movement is basically what the civil rights movement was, that it came up against such an intransigent government that the civil rights association leadership took to the streets in despair. The historical nature of the state was such that it can't be reformed. It became very, very clear, in fact, by 69. Uh, it was clear to the people who were mobilized on the streets in 68 that the state couldn't be reformed. The problem essentially was the relationship between uh, the majority in the North who wanted to uh, maintain, if you like, that majority because they felt that they were an ascendancy, because they felt that they had been privileged throughout, uh, throughout the centuries, and naturally enough because they felt that they were getting better jobs, better houses, <coughs> when in actual fact they weren't. The problem was when there's so, many, so few jobs and so few houses going around, people want to maintain the privilege of the very few jobs and the very few limited housing that there is actually going. They saw that as essentially part of their position in the six counties, that they got these jobs and they had these houses because they were privileged. The state couldn't, dem couldn't be democratized while there was an inbuilt sectarian majority in the six counties. The difference between the Protestants was that they had the jobs, we didn't have the jobs, and they had bad housing conditions that weren't as bad as ours but they, there was a the Protestant ghettos was there as well and um, but as I say they had the jobs that they had a wee bit more than what we had I mean the way they said this the city was gerrymandered there's no way the way the council was run was always a majority loyalist Protestants I don't like using the name the word Protestant yeah. because we see it that the Protestant working class had as much problems that we had. The civil rights movement also included liberal representatives of the Protestant loyalist community who dared to believe that those reforms would also benefit the Protestant poor and working people. And it's, it's dreadful their election. The problem isn't getting the authorities to knock them down. They would very quickly agree to knock them down. The problem is getting them to build um, new houses back in their place. Uh, and that's a struggle that we've had in the Shankill because something like 7,000 houses have been demolished in this past eight years, but um, only a few hundred have been built back. And it throws a question mark out over the whole future existence of the area, really, because they're stripping out young couples with families, sending them outside the area, and just leaving behind an aging population in aging houses. In 10 years, um, people talk about the violence and the troubles, and there's no doubt that on the Shankill, the bulldozer has maybe done even more damage than bombs have done in, in many senses. It's destroyed people's whole way of life. Protestants, although better off than their Catholic neighbours, suffered wages, unemployment and living conditions that had been kept far behind those in England and Western Europe. But the efforts of progressive Protestants failed. By its very definition, Northern Ireland was a Protestant state and politics were doomed to be divided on religious lines rather than united on social issues. Ian Paisley, a Presbyterian fundamentalist minister, once again revived the old image of a Protestant community besieged by Rome. Paisley proclaims that agitations for reform was only a disguise to destroy the state. I understand today that they're bringing down their barricades in order that the authorities might clean their streets for them. Having littered and turned the bog side into a filthy place, then they expect the municipal authority or the commission authority to do the cleaning up for them. Now I want to say something this afternoon and underline it. And 
as far as I am concerned, the Protestant people have had enough of this condoning of poverty and this devotion. Paisley realised that he was under a good hobby horse then and uh, started setting up the opposition to the movement, which eventually led to uh, gun attacks in Belfast and various areas. Uh, even a case of uh, a man in the name of Devaney here in the bog side was battered to death by the police. This was their automatic reaction to the movement as of the working people that was going forward. Uh, in other words, we're not giving you anything, but we're going to batter you back into the ground. Now, this done more than anything else to unite the people. They realised that here we are in the usual situation where uh, when we asked for what is ours, that we're going to get the jackpot or be gone down. So from there, it automatically developed into the, the defence of the area and through that, you really came into the armed struggle. A state like the Northern State that was based on the continuing ascendancy of the Nihilists and the Unionists used the institutions of the state to break down the civil rights movement and out of the breakdown of the civil rights movement by police action uh, was, came the, the, the violence really. The guns then were introduced at that stage. Nobody really knew how it was going to end up. We didn't expect it to end up the way it did. We were gullible to believe that we were going to get one man, one vote, and more jobs and more better housing conditions. We didn't realise the events that was going to happen. By the summer of 1969, the middle ground was fast disappearing. Newspapers reported police cooperation in violent attacks on civil rights marches and Catholic neighbourhoods. The nationalist community in Derry barricaded itself in the bog side and for all practical purposes seceded from the state. Mick Devine was 14 at the time and manned the barricades of what was called Free Derry. He kept a diary and wrote. Within a month everyone was a political activist. I had never had a political thought in my life but now we talked of nothing else. The speed of events gave me a quick education. There has never been any year or part of a year in the history of this state where it was not necessary to use undemocratic and emergency legislation which took away the basic right of the citizen in order to maintain the state. Now if the price for maintaining the state is to take away the right of at least 30% of the citizens within it, then it has to be arguable that the state itself does not have a right to exist. And we have gone through the Special Powers Act of the 1920s, the Emergency Acts and the Poor Laws of the 30s, uh, the Special Powers Act enacted again in the 40s and the 50s. There hasn't been a generation of Catholics in the North of Ireland that has not been interned without trial. There has not been a generation of, of anti-unionists in the North of Ireland that have not been tried before non-jury courts. There has not been uh, a generation in the history of the state of Northern Ireland that has ever known or understood what impartial law, order, courts, judges, police, or armies were. On August 12, 1969, British troops began arriving in Northern Ireland with the announced aim of keeping the peace between the Loyalists and the Catholic Nationalist populations. Mick and his community welcomed the troops as a relief from their siege by loyalist extremists and the police. The province, Northern Ireland, was constitutionally part of the United Kingdom under the 1921 settlement, and civil order had broken down. Though it was part of the United Kingdom, it was effectively a devolved government, an independent government. It was not able to command sufficient support in all sectors of the community or to maintain civil order without the intervention of the 
mainland, if you like. And so um, troops had to be brought in. Isn't they, that why they brought in the British soldiers? To protect the people? Yeah. Yes, to protect the people from the police. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the reason they gave. That was the reason that... That was the reason the Catholics thought that the troops were being brought in. But in fact, Harold Wilson, who was the Prime Minister of England at the time, uh, later on, admitted that the reason why they, the reason why they brought in the, that the reason why they brought in the, the troops was that they wanted to uphold the um, the existing government. Nothing to do with the protection of the Catholics protection of the Catholics was absolutely uh, an unimportant issue. The government of the time, which was an evil, stormant government, had to be upheld at all costs. And that was the reason why the troops were brought in. But of course the Catholics believed that they were being brought in for their protection. Police never protected the people here. Never. In October 69, the first time I went there, the troops had been in for two months by that period. But it was still very much the honeymoon period, I think. Um, when the soldiers first went there, they really had the impression that they were going in a peacekeeping role, that they were there to keep the two sets of, of religious fanatics apart, if you like. And there's a great feeling that they were doing a lot of good, they were saving lives, um, and it was a worthwhile form of soldiering. And that attitude, it lasted probably six months with some of the soldiers, the slower ones perhaps, it lasted a year, but it was very apparent to many soldiers within a very short time that, that their role was changing, and changing quite quickly. Instead of, being, instead of being able to tell themselves that they were a peacekeeping force, keeping the two sides apart, saving lives, it became very apparent that their role was changing to one of an aggressive role against the nationalist community. Feeling itself faced with a population in virtual insurrection, the government in 1970 reintroduced a policy of internment. In pre-dawn raids on the first day of internment, 350 adults were arrested and held without charges or trial. Only two of the people picked up were loyalists. In the coming years, thousands of people were interned. But internment, rather than containing the population, only increased its determination. And the Nash's people responded by becoming aggressive towards the army. The army became aggressive towards the national population. The whole thing fed on itself. Mm -hmm. And within a year, you had a situation that was very apparent to ordinary soldiers, that when they went into the nationalist areas, they were not peacekeeping at all. They were occupying those nationalist areas. They were in a position of, they were in a state of war against the people in those nationalist areas. In Derry, a civil rights organization march to protest internment was scheduled for January 30, 1972. The outcome of this march would change forever the course of events in Northern Ireland and the life of Mick Devine. At that time, Mick was very cagey. It wasn't actually the bloody Sunday that Mick had to make a decision. He had to decide whether he was going to accept British rule in Ireland and all the brutality that went with it or whether it fight. So Mickey took up arms for national liberation of Ireland. Within 15 minutes, 13 people were shot dead and 29 wounded. The British government claimed that the troops had been shot at, yet there was no army casualties and no arms or ammunition were found in the area. Before they even stopped, the Saracen tanks got on his legs and shot everywhere. And about a second after, so the soldiers and done the same thing. And we heard them from that flat there calling, don't stop shooting, shoot the Irish bastards. And I say again that I hesitate to call anyone large, but the fact are we were fired at first. And we retaliated in the only way which was possible to us. Thank you. 
mass murder. And I don't care who hears me say it. And I don't care. I never hope they love to see the day that'll never happen again. Right. Pure murder. Murder. Two weeks before Bloody Sunday, at least two weeks before Bloody Sunday, I wasn't in, 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 in Derry at that time, I was in Newry, but I mean, the grapevine spread all through the, the soldiers in the north. The feeling was that there needed to be some kind of, of, of short, sharp military shock to try and end the thing, really, to try and teach these, 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 these paddies a lesson. And when Bloody Sunday happened, it was no surprise to anybody. I think the severity of it shocked a lot of soldiers, um, especially those who did have some sort of ethical concern about the nature of the soldiering they were doing. And there used to be a lot of soldiers that felt that way. And after Bloody Sunday, the desertion rate was enormous. In his diary, Mick wrote, I will never forget standing in the Cregan Chapel, staring at the wooden boxes. We mourned, and Ireland mourned with us. When I looked at those coffins, I developed a commitment to the Republican cause that I never lost. I think it was the, the most traumatic single event that in the history of this city um, during this century. Um, it caused enormous anger, resentment. It threw many young people into the IRA. Um, the shootings themselves, and 29 people were shot, 13 of them died in the space of 10, 15 minutes. And I think the thing then that further compounded the anger was the fact that the commander of the uh, troops concerned was decorated by the British government subsequently. And then uh, that a, an inquiry was set up, chaired by the British Lord Chief Justice at the time, Lord Widgery. Um, he decided that the soldiers firing bordered on the reckless. That was his finding. My view of it is that 13 young people, innocent young people, were murdered. And um, I witnessed the shootings of some of them. I haven't changed my views on it since then. Uh, I think it was a dreadful atrocity. And uh, I don't think there's any other word to describe it. The impact on me personally, it caused great sadness, sorrow, shock, grief, anger. But I think the lasting impact of it was, to me, the obscenity of violence. It certainly changed my attitudes radically on that, that the use of violence to achieve political objectives. After Bloody Sunday, relations between the army and the Catholic minority deteriorated beyond repair. The Catholics felt under direct attack by the army, and for many Catholics, the IRA was seen as the only reliable protective and defensive force. I, I can hear the military here every morning coming, uh, morning after morning, four o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, taking people out of their houses, bringing them away for questioning about uh, their religion, about their politics, about their social habits. Um, I can do nothing about that. Nobody can do anything about that. Uh, you just have to hear the neighbours being dragged away and, and you, you turn over and go to sleep. What else can you do? Now, the everyday realities of it is it a reality of unemployment, bad education, uh, lack of protection, uh, having your home invaded by uh, soldiers who can come in at any hour of the day. They can come in any hour of the day or night. They can do more than the police can do. That's the reality of it. And at the same time, finding that all those associations and institutions that you belong to, 
I belong to universities, I belong to the church, I belong to uh, a, a very, some uh, very, what are looked upon as influential associations. Not one of them will come to the assistance of these people. I, at the time, we didn't know Mickey wasn't, we knew that he was involved, we didn't know that he was so deeply involved. Uh, Mickey had joined the young Fina. What is that? That's like the junior wing mm -hmm. of the IRA. I was the officer commanding the, uh, the INLA in Derry when Michael was, uh, was alive. Michael was a, a young individual, um, unemployed, um, who believed, as most of us believed, that uh, the occupation forces were something that we just simply couldn't tolerate. That uh, constantly being arrested and stopped and searched, our houses raided every morning in life, Michael was one of the guys who said, right, this is the time to go in and, and stop it. What we're saying as the um, power, what Westminster is saying is the power responsible for security and law and order, is that while these two kinds of politics are legitimate, illegitimate politics cannot be tolerated. You can't do this kind of thing uh, in a civil society, in a democracy, uh, through the gun. And therefore, both communities in the province and the uh, government of the Republic, who agree with us totally about this, have a very strong interest to try and squeeze those who would seek legitimate political ends uh, by terrorist methods. We deny that we are a terrorist organization because we believe um, that uh, terrorist organizations have no basis in the community at all. Uh, we believe that unlike organizations like Bader Meinhof and the Reds Brigades and the rest of them, that our links are very close to the community, that we, uh, we were created as a result of the general political upheaval within our community, and that uh, we arose as a result of that upheaval. We didn't suddenly emerge without any demand for our existence, that there was a demand by the people in our community for armed resistance and for defense of the community. Um, defense against loyalists, defense against loyalist assassination gangs, defense against the SAS, and defense against the whole repressive machinery which Britain has in the six counties. We, are resu we arose as a result of that. That doesn't make us a terrorist organization, that makes us an organization of the people. Uh, fight for Ireland, I believe in fight for Ireland. Will you be willing to fight for Ireland? I'd, I'd be willing to die for Ireland. He didn't like the killing at all, you know, I don't think he ever killed anybody in his life, you know, he was only 19 when he died and I suppose he knew someday he might be sort of sent out maybe to do something like that, but I know he didn't up until he died, like I know he didn't do that, you know, but he believed he was fighting for his country and he loved his country, you know, and I suppose that, it, well, I just went with him, you know, it was heartbreaking at times, you know, because he was knocked about quite a bit, you know, and uh, it was heartbreaking at times for me. But what else could I do? It's what he wanted, you know. It's not what I would have chosen for him, like, in his younger days. Like, I never would have thought about that, you know. But it's what he wanted to do, you know. It's heartbreaking, but it's something you have to do, you know. I just feel it. I like, obviously, fresh flowers on, on the grave and that, you know. And I know it's not the pleasantest place to be, like, but sure. It's just the way I feel about it. I just like to put the flowers on his grave every week, you know. I like to let him know that he's still thought about every day and every minute of every day, you know. Although not the only political force in the Catholic community, the IRA has succeeded in generating widespread support. Publicly, the British government attributes this success to a campaign of intimidation. But a British Army intelligence report on the IRA dated November 2nd, 1978, stated that, quote, the movement will retain popular support sufficient to maintain secure bases. Knowing that the risk death or imprisonment, the Nationalist Catholic youth in Northern Ireland continue to volunteer for IRA service. When Mickey was arrested, he was taken to Castlereagh. He was taken to Strandwood Police Barracks first. 
and he was held there for two or three days. Where he was moved to Castle Ray. He doesn't sign. Mickey doesn't sign, no confessions. But they kept us running around for three days that we didn't know where Mickey was. They passed the book over the um there you see told us the army had him. Um oh my god off. In 1976, Mick was arrested and accused of raiding a private weapons collection. According to Northern Ireland's Emergency Provisions Act, when charged with possession of firearms, the burden of proof is on the accused. In the court, one is presumed guilty and must prove otherwise. The trial is conducted without a jury. The court accepts as evidence statements procured by the use of physical mistreatment. Judicial interpretation of Section 8 of the Act specifically allows a moderate degree of physical mistreatment during interrogation. In 1978, Amnesty International reported the British government systematically used inhuman and degrading methods of interrogation. They held him there for seven days, and then eventually they moved him to the Cromwell Road Jail, where he was remanded for nine months. And what does that mean? That's another word for internment. The British government changed it when the term had come out, they changed it to detention. I mean, some of the lads there was held up maybe three years. Mickey was one of the lucky ones. He was held for nine months this on is, remand. This is before trial. Before trial. He's held without trial. Mick Devine was convicted on June 20, 1977, and sentenced to 12 years in Long Cash Prison renamed the maze by the British. He was assigned to H Block 5. He immediately joined 350 fellow prisoners in their protest to regain political status. The average age of prisoners in Long Cash is 18 to 23 years. All were convicted under special emergency legislation. These prisoners saw the attempt to label them as criminals as an extension of Britain's effort to criminalize the entire Republican movement. In order to implement the law and take the people off the streets, the government had to accept in the face of the people that where you had special powers of arrest, special interrogation centers, special courts, special sentences, and special laws, that the end product was a special prisoner. The British government accepted that and it existed up until 1976, when purely as an arbitrary decision, as a political decision, because at that time Britain thought that the resistance to the British government in Ireland was at its lowest point. Political status was taken away. There is no such thing as political murder, political bombing or political violence. There is only criminal murder, criminal bombing, and criminal violence. As a protest against labeling them common criminals, the prisoners refused to wear the prison uniform or to conform to prison regulations. Prison authorities retaliated by removing so-called privileges. The first man they refused to wear the uniform was Kieran Nugent. The prison uniform, and Kieran Nugent says that for them, to put a uniform on his back, they'd have to nail it on his back. So, why did, why did he because he was not a criminal, they wear the uniform was, was the criminalization, and they say and we say they weren't criminals, they were freedom fighters. I mean, Mickey, like most of the lads, they wouldn't have been on there today only because of the political situation in the north of Ireland. So they refused to be criminalized, they refused to wear the prison uniform. So all they had was a blanket to put around them. And they sat in their cell 24 hours a day. They had no reading material, the only thing they had was a Bible. The only time they got out of their cell was to go to Mass on a Sunday. Outside, they're big names, but inside, understood more the likes of Mickey Devane and Bobby Sands 
for organizing the things the way they got things going, kept kept men going strong, mentally, with being locked up 24 hours a day in the cell, you had nothing else to do. Because when the new no, no wise, no slapout protest started, everything was taken out of your cell. No, the, the religious magazines you had, like, everything, that's exactly what it was, just religious magazines. That's all you were allowed, religious books. So therefore, you had nothing else to do. But what we had, you just got old bits of toothpaste tubes and this root in the wall. And then you just, an old bit of mattress, you just rubbed it off again and you kept on learning Irish day in for an hour or two hours every day. Started to pick up. When they're learning Irish during the day, then at night time you're doing history lessons, again as I say, on Ireland, but on the other countries, why they had their freedom struggles going, right up from Ireland from 1798 and before, beforehand, right up to 1980, 1979, whenever it was the lecture was being given. And this just sort of brought everything into focus, why they were fighting, why they were in jail, why the British government had them on the blanket, not just to keep them in jail, but just to try criminalize the whole Republican movement as a whole. After five years of blanket protest, when their demands still had not been met, the prisoners intensified the struggle by refusing to clean their cells or to carry their chamber pots to the toilets to be emptied. This was the dirty protest. We were forced into that situation because after the 7th of February, you know, we were refused access to the toilet. We weren't uh, allowed out onto the wing to go into the bathrooms to wash ourselves, you know. And when we did, the, the chamber pots were filled up and we, were throwing, we started to throw the urine out the windows and out the spy holes. These were blocked up, which meant, you know, there was nothing else we could do except put the excreta on the wall. You know, and, you know, I used to vomit, you know, all the time because the stench it was, you know, I've never wanted to do anything like it before in my life, and I, you know, I'd like to think that I would never have to go out to, to see anything like it again. Communique from Long Kesh, March 1, 1981. We prisoners here have resisted any attempt by the British government to criminalize us and our struggle. Because of this, we are kept in solitary confinement, naked with the exception of a blanket subject to constant brutality, degradation, and humiliation, all in an attempt to crush our spirit. Therefore, having exhausted every means of seeking a solution, we are left with but one alternative, the ultimate form of protest, hunger strike. discredited cause. The men of violence have chosen in recent months to play what may well be their last card. They tried every other means of protest. The only other weapon they had was a hunger strike. And um, when we realized Mickey had gone off, when we, we hadn't received a, a visit in Mickey in two years. And um, when we get the letter out that morning from the Northern Ireland office, we knew that Mickey was going on the hunger strike. We went up that Saturday morning and we pleaded with him not to go on the hunger strike because uh, six men had died at this time on the hunger, the time Mickey got on it. Um, when Mickey, when we sat and talked over and realized all that Mickey had suffered in the past four years, we knew Mickey was right. Mickey wasn't a criminal. But you see, we didn't realize Mickey, we didn't think Mickey was going to die. After he had been without food for some weeks, Mick wrote to a friend, I do not wish to die, for I have too much to live for. Yet in what manner must we live? If we have not our dignity, then what have we? I am what I am, a human being, a man with feelings and emotions. Yet in the eyes of my oppressors, I am nothing.
The hunger strike generated support for the nationalist cause unseen since internment. A coalition of community organizations, labor unions, members of the clergy and others held large demonstrations demanding political status for the prisoners. Dock section supported the hunger strike because uh, we believe that they were entitled to political status. Because they were political prisoners. And if it wasn't for the current troubles, 99.9% .9 of those lads would never have saw the inside of the jail. If it took a special court to sentence them, that's a non-jury court. If it took a special law to charge them, then surely when they're convicted, they're then entitled to the special category that goes along with any other political prisoner throughout the world. They weren't terrorists, they were in prison for a political cause. What do you do? What cause? How do you describe it? The unification of Ireland. Is that something that you fuck to do? Yeah. Every Irish man with his salt agrees with the unification of Ireland. They were fighting for what they believed, a cause they believed in. So the copy class is criminals. The agencies that procured the uh, confessions had been found uh, by international investigative bodies to have used brutality in securing confessions, and those confessions led to their conviction and their imprisonment. And I said that I would support the prisoners' rights uh, to make demands for special treatment. On Mick's 42nd day of hunger strike, the phenomenon he dreaded most occurred. Due to severe vitamin deficiency, he lost muscular control of his eyes, which gyrated wildly in their sockets. He had spells of dizziness and vomited mucus. After three days, this had passed, but the end was in sight. Last week at Mickey was on, he was blind, and his teeth had locked. He spoke through his teeth. But um, two days before he died, I asked him to come off the hunger strike, and he told me that I was only prolonging his agony. He says, if, you, if I go in that coma and you sign, he says, I'll go straight on the hunger strike again. Well, there are people who think that uh, just make you die because they want to commit suicide. But they didn't. Most of the people just say they died of healthy free air. That's a little. What does Ireland need to be free from? That's Blood from the cops. Now you see, when you do that. There can be nothing more vulnerable than one person on their own, naked and without food. And they couldn't be beaten. Bobby Sands here in Doherty and those lads average 60, 70 days dying. But they couldn't be beaten. And I think for a whole generation of people, apart from anything else, what they did do was take away the fear of dying. A whole generation of kids here are not afraid to die. Not anxious to die, but they're not afraid to die. If Mickey had a, wore the uniform, if he had accepted criminalization, Mickey would have been due release now next September. I mean, he was 27 years of age. He had everything he loved for. He would have been released next September. Well, 
Margaret, no, I don't think we could have been it, only because of Mickey's strength. Because, strength. you know, even that day that, um, two days before Mickey died, when we asked him to come off a hunger strike, Mickey knew exactly, he turned and he told us, and that right, Margaret, and he says that, um, I had made me peace with God. Right. He says, I have views around me, he says, and I'm happy. Right. He says, what more do I want? Family around me. He gave us the impression that it was us. But it was causing an uh, inconvenience, uh, you know, uh, his whole worry was he's getting knocked after, he's getting uh, something to eat and by transport and that was his whole worry. He he never worried. And and the the week before Mickey died, I can stand here now at his grave and honestly say that I never heard Mickey complain. He didn't? Not he once. He didn't complain. And we would say to him, What about today, Mickey? And he'd say, Oh I'm great today. You know, I was up at seven, I slept on this morning, I used to joke and crack about it. And Margaret and me were sitting one day and we were ready for breaking down. But when you, when you looked at Mickey, you know, when you, you says, well, how you know under God could anybody complain about sitting in a long cash or complain about not getting your proper meal? When you looked at Mickey sitting there in a, a big dinner sitting at the bottom of the bed. The, the, the food, dinners. The food was always, food. you know, and that's what was so heartbreaking about it. And then when the, when the breakfast was over, they brought on the dinner. When the dinner was over, they brought on the and supper that night, you know. The His mouth was very, very sore up near the end. Uh, very bad, wasn't it? Uh, all on sight of it was all broke out in spots and things were going on down his throat. But when I, um... Remember the day I went to get in the water, he closed uh, his mouth right. tight. But you know, you know the tissue peppers? You know, we sat all day dabbing his mouth with water. And then the screw ass beat it, I want some vaseline. But then she had some medication too. I'd be afraid of testing it, you know. I mean, he wouldn't. He might have thought I was giving him something to eat. Yeah. He wouldn't trust me. Couldn't even put Vaseline in his mouth because he didn't come to a coma. It was three hours before That's he died. Three hours before he died, uh, you know, in the coma. And for about two days before he died, I when Tracy and myself were done in the morning, we would ask, "What will we do today? Will, will we talk to him? Will we keep him alert? We or will we let him slap?" And then we didn't know what to do. And then when we seen him then suffering, we decided then we'll not we'll not talk to him anymore, we'll not try and keep him. We'll let him slip under a coma. But he must have been very, very strong because he didn't. It was three hours before That's he true. died. Maybe even two. Uh, the day before he died, when we were praying along with him, we stopped the praying. And he That's squeezed our uh, hand to uh, keep uh, praying, you know. Uh, so um, But as Margaret says, we are very proud of Mickey. Mickey didn't die a crumble. No. He never was a cry. He wouldn't have been there only because of the political situation. And um, he also died a freedom fighter, which he was. Even now, you see, even now, four months after it, I find it, it's even, it gets more emotional for me. I would think so, you too, Teresa. For I come down here every Sunday and I would stand just like this here and I can't even pray. You know, I just stand the way I'm standing now, just looking around me. And that, it, it, it gets more emotional each time. Four months after Mickey died, and his uncle is preparing to initiate the first of community bands, honoring the local Derry lads who died on hunger strike, Patsy O'Hara and Mick Devine.
nor is it in any way punitive or indiscriminate. Its benefits should be felt, not least in those places where violent men have exercised a certain sway by threat and intimidation over decent and responsible men and women. And I think that after the work of Her Majesty's government over these recent months, the patience of Her Majesty's government, the work to convince the minority community that we are determined to give them a fair deal, I trust this friction will not arise. I see no reason why it should. Tell me one thing that these poor people could have tried and didn't try. They tried everything. Now when they take up the guns, they're beaten into the ground. The fight has to go on. The fight will go on. It has to go on. Because if it's not settled now, it's going to rise up again in the next another 10 years' time. The U.S. Chronicle focuses on violence and housing projects in Houston and other large cities around the country. Stay with us.